We see what it is, what it's doing. We know through research that certain parts of the brain are supposed to do, produce faster ways. Uh, other parts of the brain are supposed to produce slower ways. And oftentimes there's an imbalance or a crossover where the one that's supposed to produce faster ways is producing slower ways. So that changes the person's ability to function in an appropriate way. And once we help to rebalance that, they function in a much more appropriate way. Neural feedback is a form of biofeedback. It's, it's using your mind to control bodily functions. And in the case of neural feedback, we, use, we train the brain. We actually retrain brain waves, or the, the amplitudes of brain waves and the location of brain waves. And then we can teach them how to change some of the things in their brain. For example, if they have slow brain waves, as is typical for children with attention deficit disorders, uh, we can teach them to make those slow brain waves go faster. You place sensors on the brain. I guess I'm a, I'm a little bit clearer uh, <laughs> example, but I mean, you, you, uh, we just use a little bit of paste uh, and put the sensors in a couple different parts of the brain, and we can immediately start uh, tracking electrical activity. We, you know, when I say electrical activity, one of the things I think a lot of us lose sight of is that the human body is, 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 is I mean, we're, we're electric, okay? When we move, there's an electrical impulse in our muscles. So you attach sensors to the head, which right. are attached to a computer. Right. But nothing comes in from that computer. Nothing at all. It's, it's all. it's all monitoring. It is kind of amazing to think that your brain can control what's happening on the computer screen. Regular biofeedback is you, you get, for instance, you might have a thermometer in your hand and you're watch, watching the numbers go up. That's visual feedback. Okay. Um, with neurofeedback, there are brain waves that are measured, they go into a computer, and it comes out as visual feedback uh, and also auditory feedback. So you can actually see what your brain is doing. Yes. Yes. But nothing comes into your brain from the computer. No, no. So it's not dangerous. No, I'm not um, getting shock treatment. No, <laughs> no. You're, I, I always tell people that your job is to shock the computer. Oh. How do you know what the brain needs, and how does this all connect to things like depression or right. other problems that people may have, like ADD or other things? People usually come in with a problem, and we then. We refine it and ask questions. We have um, some questions that we need to know more about their um, nervous system. And we also do a, a little um, assessment, a brainwave assessment, to see whether certain areas are functioning in the right way or not. We want to see if certain patterns exist, because that, if there are, some patterns are correlated with various conditions such as depression as a certain pattern, or uh, anxiety, you'd see a certain pattern. ADD, you see a certain pattern. And if you see that pattern, you want to be able to change it to the more appropriate pattern. What you actually do then is take a picture of the brain and then compare it to other pictures that you have in your database. Yes, the computer does that on a digital level. We digitize the EEG. We call it a quantitative EEG. And that enables us then to take that data and compare it to data that's been stored in the databases. We have a normative standard database, and that gives us a difference map to show us how that patient's brain is functioning, either above or below what patients' brains are doing who do not have that particular type of disorder. In knowing where the location is of over and under activation, we can then later do what we call neural training, neural feedback. What do you do when somebody comes to see you? How do you decide if that person is a good, let's say, candidate for neural feedback? There are many parts to that discussion. A lot of it has to do with the goals and desires of the client. If they know nothing about neural feedback and it is one of the options for treatment, I'll explain it in the context of all the things that we could do. If they've come focused looking for neurofeedback, we'll explore whether it's really appropriate for them, whether it meets their needs in terms of their schedule or time. Uh, some people just want to get started with neurofeedback. 
Uh, so I just give them a slew of assessments to do. Um, I talk to them about their history, get to know them a little bit. Uh, I do an assessment, a brainwave assessment, because um, what I need to know is what kind, what 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 kinds of overactivity, underactivity, is generating their their their, their difficulty. After that, we'll you know we'll discuss it with the family, see what we need to do, and then set up sessions. We set up a, a game that the brain has to play. It has to achieve those goals that are defined within the paradigm in order to play the game. And in the process, the brain learns. And probably what happens is the brain creates proteins as it learns. Those proteins change structure, structure changes neurotransmitter levels, and voila, we have a brain that can do on its own what we've been trying to do with drugs for many years. Okay, it doesn't hurt, right? Oh, we're attaching an electrode that's a sensing electrode. It doesn't go into the skin, it doesn't put anything into the skin. It's simply a sensor picking up electrical activity from the brain. So the information is going out? Into the computer, the computer creates a response based on what we've asked the computer to look for. The response is fed back to the brain. The brain says, I understand. I got to hear the tone. I got to see the picture of whatever software we're using. I got the response, which is a reward. There's usually a visual reward and an auditory reward that says, you did good. And the brain says, I'd like to do good. <laughs> Okay, I think the, uh, the, the, this video s says all about biofeedback neurofeedback better than I can do. So uh, let me just move on. The formal definition of biofeedback is that it is a process that enables an individual to learn how to change physiological activity for the purposes of improving health and performance. Precise instruments measure physiological activity such as brain waves, uh, <clears throat> heart function, breathing, muscle activity, and skin temperature, these instruments rapidly and accurately feed back information to the user. The presentation of this information, often in conjunction with changes in thinking, emotions, and behavior, supports desired physiological ch changes. Over time, these changes can endure without continued use of an instrument. Next. Here's just all, all other explanations. Uh, the technique of using monitors devices to obtain information about an involuntary function of the central or autonomic nervous system, such as body temperature, muscle tension, EEG, or blood pressure, in order to gain some voluntary control over the function. A training, a treatment for procedure in which a person is given information about physi physiological processes, heart rate or blood pressure, for example, that is not normally available you know, or involuntary with the goal of gaining conscious control of them based on the principles of operant conditioning. Next. Here is a picture, but I'm not going to go through it since it's already explained in the slide. Okay. So the difference between neurofeedback and biofeedback basically is that neurofeedback focuses on the brain. So sometimes it's called a central EG biofeedback. Next. Okay. Here are some examples uh, of kind of, of uh, <coughs> disorder that are used uh, with biofeedback. The first class disorder associated with over or under physiological arousal, for example, headaches, TMD, Raynaud's disease, various pain conditions. The biofeedback goal is to lower or to increase arousal. Secondly, neuromuscular re-education, for example, for stroke rehab, gait training, biofeedback assisted musculoskeletal therapy, urinary and fecal incontinence. Another group is a peak performance training and the performance enhancement of athletes, executives, education, and in arts and music. And heart rate variability biofeedback is used to reduce non-cardiac chest pain, irritable bowel syndrome, psychiatric disorders such as depression and PTSD, and medical disorders such as asthma and fibromyalgia. And the goal of HRV biofeedback is to use biofeedback devices to help patients identify and breathe at a resonant frequency and thus increase the HRV. Next. Okay, so we are going to just talk, detail a little bit on HRV biofeedback because the field is very broad. We don't have time to go into all the other forms. 
It's a, it's a new boy on the block. It's the newest form of our feedback. It's great and potential, potential uh, promise due to its close connection to physiological uh, physiology, the heart rate variability, central to the health and performance. Next. Some of the slides to follow up by courtesy of a colleague of mine. So what is HRV? Heart rate variability refers to the bit-to-bit -bit variation in the time interval between heart contractions. Next. A common misconception is that a steady uh, uh, heart rate is good. No, it's not good. A healthy heart is constantly quickening and slowing from bit to bit in response to environmental de demands. So HRV occurs in response to interaction of multiple regulatory mechanisms that operate in different time scales and that influence heart rate. Next. Okay. So three main sources of HRV is respiration, barrel reflexes, and other regulatory mechanisms such as circadian rhythm. Next. Okay. The basic conception relating to HRV. Barrel receptors, which are blood pressure sensors, speed and slow heart rate via the vagus nerves, and this is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, and this process is respiration driven. So when you inhale, your heart rate increases, your blood pressure rises. When you exhale, your heart rate decreases, your blood pressure falls. And the vagus tone, it helps to maintain dynamic autonomic balance, critical to the cardiovascular health. Okay. So why is HRV important? The critical importance of HRV was noted as far back as 1965 when it was found that fetal, distresses, <coughs> fetal distress is preceded by alterations in heart rate variability before any changes occur in the heart rate itself. In the 1970s, HRV analysis was shown to predict autonomic neuropathy <coughs> in diabetic patients before the onset of the symptoms. The bottom line is, low HRV has since been confirmed as a strong independent predictor of future health problems and as the correlate of all-cause mortality. So this is very important. Reduce HRV, I'm sorry, uh, can you go back? Uh, reduce HRV associated with vulnerability to physical and psychological stresses and diseases. These are well established, there's a lot of literature on HRV. Okay, low HRV is a marker for cardiovascular disorder, including hypertension, especially with left ventricular hypertrophy, ventricular arrhythmia, chronic heart disease, and ischemic heart disease. Low HRV predicts sudden cardiac death, especially due to arrhythmia following myocardial infarction and post-heart attack survival. Reduced HRV is also seen in disorder with autonomic dysregulation, including anxiety and depressive disorders, asthma, vulnerability to sudden death, and so on. Okay, next. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about resonance frequency. Lehrer and colleagues propose that each individual's cardiovascular system has a unique resonance frequency, which is caused by the delay in the bell reflex inertia and in the blood supply accounts for most of this delay. With practice, people can learn to breathe at the cardiovascular system's resonance frequency. This aligns the three oscillators, the bell reflex, heart rate, and blood pressure at that frequency and moves the peak frequency from the high frequency range, for example, of 0.2 Hz to the low frequency range of 0.1 Hz. Breathing at the resonant frequency more than doubles the energy in the low frequency band of the EEG and centers the peak frequency at the cardiovascular system's resonant frequency. The mechanism for this effect lies in a confluence of processes. Number one, the phase relationship between heart and <coughs> I'm sorry, heart rate oscillations and breathing at specific frequencies. Number two, phase relationship between heart rate and blood pressure oscillations at specific frequency. Number three, activity of the barrel reflex. And number four, resonant characteristics. Uh, can, can read the rest. Uh, can you move it? Oh, okay. So it's in here. No, it's gone. It's, in you. it's not in the... Oh, it's, it's not. Well, anyway, that's, that's a small detail. Uh, I can give you the slide later if you want. Next. Okay. So how do you do HRV biofeedback? There are two steps. The first step is 
uh, we have a program that will help people assess their resonance frequency. So most individual resonance frequency is from 5 to 7.5, somewhere in between. So I'll assess what your resonance frequency is and then train you to breathe at that resonance frequency. So that's the bottom line. Uh, it's not as simple as it looks, but that's just make a simplistic view. That's what HRV bar feedback is. Okay, train you to breathe at your resonance frequency. Next. Uh, I think we are, well, we're going to kind of skip this right now and see if we have time at the end to actually show you. Uh, Hong Kong here will show you later, but let's move on. This will be how you do HRV bar feedback. You see there are two sensors. Uh, one, oh, where was my, the light. Oh, oh there's a light. Okay, over here you cannot see, but there's a, a, a belt to measure respiration. And then here they hook up for the EKG. Okay, next. So here is an example of somebody who start off uh, with regular breathing. You notice that the, the red line is the heart rate. The blue line is the breathing. So you notice how the breathing and heart rate all goes their own way. That's typically what happens if I were measuring your breathing right now. After the training, next. Oh, okay, so that, that's the analysis. It shows you, notice that uh, what we're aiming is 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And the average is here, okay? And if you look at the, some of the indices, they are relatively low. After training, you notice then it goes in sync, okay? And the analysis shows that it's much closer to point 0.1, I mean 0 0.1 frequency, the peak, okay? Next, okay. So basically just to show you, and if we have time later, we can actually show you the training. Let's move on to performance enhancement. So, so far we're talking about treatment of psychiatric medical conditions, but it's also used for performance enhancement. Neurofeedback holds potential for re retraining the brain waves to enhance optimal performance in athletes and in various sports. Quieting the mind to improve performance in archery, improve cognitive functions and emotional control following concussions and mild head injury, increase physical balance in gymnastics, ice skating, skiing, and other areas of performance. Next. Systemic differences found between the physiology of people expert uh, athletes and the novices. And so basically it's just an elaboration on some of the, uh, the, the study. More economic control over the brain function, neurofeedback improves golf game, improves performing arts at the Royal College of Music, etc. Just to give you some sample of what performance enhancement is. Next. I'm just going to mention briefly this one just finished by uh, one of my uh, a student, graduate student thesis. Basically what we did here is to use a single session of HRV biofeedback to see if they'll improve cognitive performance, state anxiety, scores, and HRV. Remember these are cri critical to uh, peak a performance, lower anxiety and increase uh, cognitive functions. And basically what we did is uh, we used a, uh, uh, 74 healthy university students at NUS um, and their intervention and a control group. And the results show that uh, the short duration single session HRV biofeedback is associated with improved cognitive performance. And this could be due to changes in HRV created by the HRV biofeedback intervention. So this is just a one session showing how it improved the score on a test such as a pace set, uh, which, which measures your ability to sustain attention and working memory and so on. Okay, I'm going to just show you a, a little slide of application for ADHD. Can, can the volume be? Is it too loud? Before you repeat that, I was so I turned. diagnosed with ADHD when he was in third grade and 
went to the doctor, and the doctor, the only um, solution that he had was to put him on medications. It actually seemed to help him in school, uh, but within six months he was having horrible side effects. It really changed his personality, and that was probably the worst part for us, is, is that he became like a walking zombie. We, we felt trapped, we didn't know what to do, we knew it wasn't working for him, but we didn't know what else to do. Been running internet searches since third grade, um, looking for an alternative treatment for him, and I had early on uh, read about neurofeedback. I was hoping that we could, you know, never have to put Sam back on medications, and that he would be able to function, and it would just help him. We wanted to just help him become more independent, and to give him more confidence. Hello. Hello. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. How's it going? Hey, it's uh, good. So, how are things since last time? Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, so still good? Yeah. All right. School's still good? Good. Getting back. All right. Have a seat, Sam. Let's get you hooked up. When I put the electrodes on me, it feels relaxing, and uh, when I'm at the game, it feels like uh, I'm really inside the game. All I just notice is that I'm more focused during the session. But after the session, I feel like I feel great. So you can learn. See you next time. After an air feedback made me focus more, I was able to concentrate on what the teacher was saying, and I was able to figure out what to do. I was like, wait, at one of that home, I was like, oh wait, I was like, I can do this. Sam has gone into sixth grade a completely different person. I could focus more, I could write me. Before I could not even read my writing. But uh, with the neurofeedback, I'm uh, able to read my writing. And I never know I could write to sleep. He comes home from school and the first thing he does is his homework. And I don't ask him to. He wants to do it, he wants to get it out of the way. He's done it all on his own and his grades are fantastic. He's made honor roll both semesters and uh, it's, it's been good. Tell me, tell me how baseball is different since you've been doing this very much. Well, I can focus with feet more easily. Okay. And I could, uh, I know what to do when I get into ball. And when I bat, I know where to go. I used to be a really bad sport. I was not good sportsmanship. But, uh, more, but now since I took no feedback, I don't care too much when I strike out, even though I rarely strike out. And my, my fielding is just I, I don't think I've ever been a better fielder than in my life. And I'm more confident. That's the most important part. Before I was so in confident myself, I just, before anything happened, I was like, no, I can't do this. But now, it has to take something really, really hard for that now. Now I can access more parts of my brain. It's opened up my mind to do more things. Before I thought I, before I thought I was just going to be a baseball player, I thought I could do nothing but be a baseball player. But now, since I've, uh, since neural feedback has helped me open my mind to more things, like I could be an archaeologist, I could be a poet, which I like poetry. I could be a manager of baseball, I could be a sportscaster. I can, do all, I can do most things I've done my mind. Whoever's out there, even if they think they have the perfect brain, like a student, who cares? This may even make them better. Okay, the last slide I'm going to show you is uh, efficacy of neurofeedback. Now, unfortunately, my research assistant left out all the conditions related to chronic pain. So, so this is not the, uh, the total. Um, those of you who are interested, let me know later. I can email you the, uh, you know, the slide that shows all different conditions. So basically, you're familiar with the system of level one to level five, right? Uh, in terms of efficacy. Uh, so, are you familiar or do I need to explain that? I think most people are, right? So you would see that uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and so on, you see the level two efficacy, level three efficacy, level four efficacy, and then level five. And ADHD happens to have level five efficacy. That means there's tons of control studies demonstrating that it's, it is effective in general, but only in very specific to neurofeedback. Okay. 
Uh, I want to make sure that we have uh, enough time if you have some question. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, let me just show you the other slide we have. These are the professional organizations available. Uh, most of them are in the U.S. and uh, training courses. So if for those who are interested, you can check on those. So for right now, what I'm going to do is stop and see if there's any question. Because uh, my experience in come, when I come to Singapore is that this seems to be relatively new in this part of the world. Uh, any of you have, are familiar with neurofeedback, biofeedback, have been involved in this? Oh, good. We actually have several people. Okay. You have any question? I know that it's a new technology. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, my hearing is getting old now. Oh, sorry, what do you monitor in someone? Okay, uh, in, in depression, the pattern of signature is uh, the alpha asymmetry in the frontal region. So you train the, either left or right, the uh, alpha waves are higher in one than the other. So you either train one down or train the other, or make them both in, in synchrony. Yeah. So different kind of protocol are used for different things. For example, for ADHD that you have seen just now, the reason why a child is hyper and can attend is because uh, typically when they are supposed to be producing beta waves, which is the frequency right now, all of you are probably in beta waves, processing information. However, if you are in a theta wave, that's when you are daydreaming. So you're talking to me, I... Uh, did you say something to me? You said they're not, not able to focus attention. So in that case, you up-train the beta and downtrain the theta. So all the uh, protocol have reasons for that, I mean, based, on, based on research. The other thing that uh, we didn't quite explain is that we do have a, a brain map that some of you have seen. If you look at the brain map and you compare it with the uh, normal database, you see where the deviate and you can retrain any part of the brain and so on. Any more questions coming? Uh, intervention you'll be seeing more and more health games people treat themselves and so on okay thank you